Hello, everyone. Welcome to ISGIP Live, GYM Pathology Journal Club for November 2021. I'm your moderator, Natalie Benet. And this month's topic is GYN cytopathology. So while folks are joining in, I'm going to go over some housekeeping items for this month. So Journal Club is part of is the ISGIP Live series, which many of you probably are already familiar with, but it's, it, it's comprised of many different offerings. The um, next two are the Interesting Case Presentation Conference, which is moderated by Dr. Jennifer Bennett. And this is a format with um, case presentations by trainees and early career pathologists. This happens this month at an um, off time to accommodate those from around the world who are participating. So note the different time, November 22nd at um, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. And additionally, a podcast will be coming out November 24th, and you can access that directly on this SoundCloud page down here. And this month's topic is diagnosing chronic endometritis with Dr. Vanita Par Parkash. And that, as always, is moderated by Dr. Carlos Paraharan. And um, the ISGIP live events are free to all to attend live. And even if you can't attend, if you register, a link with the recording will be sent to you 24 hours after the event airs and you can watch it for up to three days. However, if you would like to join ISGIP, you can have access to all the archived events, including the webinar lectures and slide sessions and interesting case presentations, podcasts, and journal clubs. If you'd like to join ISGIP, you can join at, or find more information at this link here. And keep in mind, if you're a trainee, it's free to join as long as um, your training program verifies your trainee status. Okay. And I always like to plug our trainee and early career pathologist um, educational formats, the interesting case presentation in this journal club and myself and Dr. Karen Talia, who moderates every other month's journal club on Australian time for those in the Eastern half of the globe. And then Dr. Jennifer Bennett, as I already mentioned, who moderates interesting case presentation conference. So we all offer, mod, uh, we offer mentorship ahead of the events. Um, we practice before we go live. The trainees have given us good feedback, positive feedback about participating, um, improving their presentation skills and their knowledge base. So please reach out to any of us. We are actively recruiting for 2021 spots um, and you can find our email addresses there. So now I'd like to introduce today's pre presenters. First is Dr. Jennifer Mingrino. She is a PGY3 at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, my old stomping grounds. and. Um, our second presenter is Dr. Uh, Joffrey Holling, and that's uh, he's a PGY3 at the University of Michigan, and I'm happy to say is pursuing GYM pathology as a career, not that I'm playing favorites um, today. And then we have Dr. Abibi Teklu. He is a fellow in gynecologic placental and perinatal pathology at Cedar sinai Medical Center. So we're really happy to have all three of them here today. And like I said, this month's theme is GYN cytopathology. Uh, Jennifer Mingrina will present an article called False Negative Papanicolaou Tests in Women with Biopsy Proven Invasive Endocervical Adenocarcinoma and Adenocarcinoma in Situ, a retrospective analysis with assessment of inter-observer agreement. And um, Dr. Joff Holling will present a paper titled Change of Practice Patterns Following an Educational Comment on Reports of Benign Appearing Endometrial Cells in Papanicolaou Tests. And then Dr. Teklu will present a paper called Endocervical Adenocarcinoma in Situ from Papa Nicolau Test to Hysterectomy, a series of 74 cases. I always like to present the, the journal club objectives here. We are trying to engage trainees in improving their scientific knowledge and critically evaluating the literature, but also to make this an inclusive process um, for those around the world at all different levels of training and to provide mentorship. And this is a um, sort of um, handout version of the PowerPoint template that is emailed to the presenters ahead of time. If you'd like to, you can take a screenshot and just kind of follow along with them. Um, this is, these are the questions they're trying to answer about the papers that they have read. So the schedule um, here, I will talk for a while and then we will hear from Dr. Mingrino, then Dr. Holling, then Dr. Teklu, and then have wrap up questions and discussion at the end. And between each presentation, we will have some polling questions. So look for that. And just to review quickly the webinar format in Zoom, if you would like to put a question for one of the presenters or for me, you can put that in the Q&A section here with the arrows pointing. If you'd just like to put a comment about maybe where you're joining from or anything else or comments or compliments to the speakers, put that in the chat. 
And then if you see a question in the Q&A that you like and you'd like it to be answered, you can actually upvote it with that thumbs up button. So now without further ado, um, let's see, I will stop sharing and Dr. Mangrino, you can share your screen and go ahead and present. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Bonet. Uh, so as she said, my name is Jennifer Mangrino, PGY3 at Brown. Today I'm going to talk about fat, false negative Papanicolaou tests in women with biopsy-proven invasive endocervical adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma in situ as a retrospective assessment of inter-observer agreement by reviewing Linadol, published earlier this year. Papanicolaou smears or pap smears successfully detect precursor lesions for squamous cell carcinoma, but not for glandular lesions. And with invasive inv endocervical adenocarcinoma increasing, accounting for 20 to 25% of cervical carcinoma, it begs the question, why do false negative pap uh, tests occur and how do we identify the causes of the misclassification? The authors highlight broad categories of po possible contributing factors, including sampling variants in which the neoplastic cells are not in the cytoprep, screening variants in which the neoplastic cells are not recognized either by automated or manual review, and diagnostic or interpretive variants in which the neoplastic cells are misclassified either as reactive endocervical cells, endometrial cells, tubal metaplasia, or atrophic vaginitis. Few studies have highlighted the importance of education in trying to minimize the difference, differences in interpretation. However, of those who have uh, investigated this, targeted instruction was said to promote not only diagnostic accuracy, um, but decrease diagnostic errors. The objectives of the, of the current study were to identify what key factors lead to falsely negative PAP test in patients with biopsy proven EA or AIS, and to analyze the impact of targeted educational instruction and in inter-observer agreement and diagno diagnostic accuracy in these cases. A retrospective search for histologically proven EA and AIS was performed from 2017 to 2020. Other parameters uh, collected were previous PAP diagnosis, high-risk HPV co-test, age, and diagnostic interval. Positive and negative results were obtained within 36 months of the biopsy proven diagnosis. In that, negative tests and controls were reviewed by a blinded consensus group to render a diagnosis. Then the sources of discrepancy for the negative tests were identified and assigned variants. After which, individual reviewers were um, reviewed the same negative tests and also the controls. In between this round one and another round of individual review, there was a two to six month washout period in which there was an educational session in which the Bethesda system was reviewed and the cytomorphology of pre-malignant, malignant, and benign mimics. Then inter-observer agreement was assessed. Individual versus consensus agreement was assessed using the COA, Cohen Kappa statistic, and overall inter-observer agreement was assessed using the Fleiss Kappa statistic. Before uh, we proceed, I thought it would be best to highlight some of the cytologic features of the entities that we'll be discussing. You can see here normal endocervical cells in different orientations. On the left, we see the nice uh, picket fence pattern of columnar cells with basally placed nuclei. In the smaller inset, you see that nice honeycomb pattern of maintained polarity. And on the right, especially in the periphery, you see low NC ratio cells with hypochromasia and only rare nucleoli. In cases um, where there are significant pitfalls, you see something like tubal metaplasia. On the left, we see a terminal bar with beautiful cilia. And on the right, we see this hyperchromatic group of endometrial cells. In cases that have cytologic and uh, cytologic features that lack uh, equivocal, um, unequivocal features of AIS and EA, we see atypical glandular cells uh, marked by hyperchromatic crowded groups on the left. And on the right, we see atypical endocervical cells not otherwise specified. Again, um, they are hyperchromatic, but there's a little bit of nuclear overlap and even a little bit of tubal metaplasia here. In uh, cases where the cellular morphology falls just short, either quantitatively or qualitatively, of EA, EA or AIS, we see atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic. You can see here a strip of crowded hyperchromatic cells with a little bit of clinging tumor diathesis. On the right, we can appreciate atypical endocervical cells favor neoplastic, in which you have nuclear crowding, significant overlap, indistinct cell borders, 
and hyperchromasia with high NC ratio. This uh, large sheet of endocervical cells displays not only the hyperchromasia and high NC ratio, but the peripheral uh, palisading and feathering that's characteristic of AIS. On the right, you can see here this rosette uh, formation of nuclear uh, vesicular nuclei that have this perpendicular um, polarization uh, around a circumferential axis. This rosette is sometimes uh, seen in AIS as an overt feature. Lastly, um, on the left, we see uh, architecture of a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma with nuclear supercrowding. On the right, I've highlighted nuclear features of adenocarcinoma marked by um, pleomorphic nuclei with open vesicular chromatin, irregular nuclear contours, and prominent large nucleoli. To return to the uh, article, 79 pap tests from 69 patients with biopsy proven EA or AIS were reviewed. And of those, um, I have a summary chart highlighting those 79 tests, um, including the high risk HPV status and the assigned variants for false negative tests. Of the 79, 57 were diagnosed with an epithelial cell abnormality. And you can see that those are stratified for you in table one on the right. In the 22 negative tests, you can see that 100% of those were high risk HPV positive. In 10 of the cases, the false negative was due to sampling variants. In the remaining 12 cases, those were upgraded at consensus diagnosis. Two of the cases were attributed to screening variants and 10 of the cases were attributed to interpretive variants. The authors looked at clinical pathologic parameters of cases with preceding negative PAPs and preceding abnormal PAPs, including age, high-risk HPV status, in situ versus invasive disease, squamous intraepithelial lesion, and interval from PAP to biopsy. And they found that there was no significant difference observed between the groups for any of these parameters. In looking at the uh, table A, you can see that the diagnoses uh, offered by consensus diagnosis are stratified here, including glandular and squamous lesions. Those were further uh, segmented into uh, high risk and low risk categories. And the 12 that were upgraded by consent of the 12 that were upgraded by the consensus diagnosis, nine had high risk um, status and three had low risk. And table three uh, recapitulates these consensus diagnoses in an itemized format and also associates them with the error type. Here we see a comparison of clinical pathologic characteristics in those negative PAP tests that were kept as negative and those that were upgraded to low risk and high risk, risk status. The notable points here are that the type of PAP was, uh, excuse me, there was less change showcased on the sure path versus thin prep method in the type of PAP test. In the average number of ECC groups, there was a statistically significant difference in negative groups versus upgraded cases, three versus 11.75 and the P equals 0 0.02. Of the average biopsy involvement, there was a percentage increased involvement in upgraded cases. And for transition zone involvement, there was a percentage increase in low risk versus nil and high risk cases. Of the eight, uh, PAP tests that were falsely negative and upgraded to glandular lesions only, we saw that the consensus diagnosis is here, and six were attributed to interpretive variants, two were uh, changed to, excuse me, attributed to screening variants. In many of these cases, there were very few uh, cells denoted by the one versus three. In all of the uh, lesions that were upgraded, there were hyperchromatic crowded groups present. Most of them had nuclear enlargement and nuclear overlap. Many of the overt features of adenocarcinoma in situ were not present, such as feathering, pseudostratified strips, and rosettes. Here we see an analysis of the individual reviewer responses and variants in false negative tests upgraded to glandular lesions. There was a portion of correct diagnoses by individual reviewers that increased by a statistically significant margin in this case. Abnormal cells were quite often misclassified as either reactive glandular cells in seven of the eight cases and as endometrial cells in five of the eight cases. The agreement between individual reviewers and consensus, as I said before, was assessed by Cohen's Kappa statistic, which is a great measure of inter-rater reliability for two raters. It showed that following education, there was an improvement in the degree of agreement and they assessed it as moderate uh, agreement. 
33% in round one versus 75% in round two. The overall inter-observer uh, variability and or agreement was assessed by the FLICE Kappa statistic, again, a measure of inter-rater reliability, but this is good for a multiple number of raters. And this will increase by a statistically significant margin uh, after education from 0.274 to 0.382. For the following images, I'm showcasing examples of high and low agreement with various sources of interpretive and sample variants highlighted by the authors. You can see here on the left that there's an enlarged hyperchromatic loop nuclei with feathering present. This was reclassified as AIS. Diagnosis was attributed to interpretive variants the first time and overall agreement in both rounds was high for this particular case. In figure four on the right, you can see in A, there's an enlarged hyperchromatic uh, group with a but there's abundant cytoplasm. This was characterized as most consistent with reactive changes. However, when other parts of the uh, uh, specimen were reviewed, there was higher NC ratio uh, cells appreciated in other enlarged hyperchromatic groups, and this was reclassified as AIS as well. The inter-observer agreement was low in round one for this case and with modest improvement in round two. For case three, we see that there are glandular cells here on the left with nuclear enlargement and contour irregularities most consistent with neoplasia. The inter-observer agreement was low in round one with minimal improvement seen in round two. And lastly, in this case, we see abundant obscuring acute inflammation, and there was only one hyperchromatic group identified with enlarged nuclei in this particular case. The inter-observer agreement for this case was low in both rounds. The sensitivity rate of PAP test to detect EA and AIS after review was 87.3% for this case. This increased to 100% by incorporating the high-risk HPV co-test, which um, implies the optimization of detection and follow-up. There was no association found between squamous lesions and increased detection of glandular cell abnormalities, although there were quite a few squamous abnormalities identified in, some of, in, in the cases. Of the 22 false negative PAP test, sampling variants um, was present in 10. And in these cases, there were fewer ECC cell groups compared with the other PAP test. This variance also highlights the difficulty in sampling glandular lesions as they tend to be higher and deeper in the endocervical canal. The high-risk HPV status in these cases seems to be instrumental in directing follow-up for these cases, especially for those of which glandular abnormalities were not detected cytologically. Screening variance was uh, attributed to two, in two cases. Uh, both had rare abnormal cells and one had the acute obscuring inflammation that I just showed you. This um, screening variance brings into question the effectiveness of automated uh, screening algorithms. However, many studies support the effectiveness of identifying glandular lesions in the field of views. However, a small risk remains of missing significant lesions with only a few diagnostic cells. Lastly, the interpretive variance was attributed in 10 cases. Most of these cases had few glandular cells. All of the upgraded cases had hyperchromatic crowded groups with nuclear enlargement and overlap. But again, uh, they did not have the overt features of AIS that we'd expect. Most frequently interpretive variance was, uh, was uh, under classification of neoplastic glandular cells as reactive endocervical cells or endometrial cells. The interpretive variance occurred more frequently in thin prep versus sure prep, and that was statistically significant. And the sure path was said to have better nuclear detail. The high risk HPV status and preliminary negative um, PAP tests in some of these cases especially with hyperchromatic groups and obscuring factors, may benefit from a focus rescreen. Results here are consistent with previous findings and further elucidate the reasons for falsely negative PAP tests in cases of biopsy-proven EA and AIS. Moderate agreement after educational sessions is a compelling demonstration of, educational, of education's impact on interpretive variants. However, even though there was a significant increase in inter-observer agreement after education, in nine of the cases upgraded to a high risk status, five were still classified as nil or low risk following rescreen. So there was a persistence of interpretive variance. The authors acknowledged that review bias and educational priming may have been present. They tried to control for this by the blinded nature of the study and also using control cases. 
The study was conducted at a large academic center with educational resources, high case volume and expertise, which might not be available to everyone, but education was still said to be uh, beneficial to all. Participants with the least amount of experience had the most improvement, improvement at the end of the study. Lastly, I say that the author's suggestion to increase targeted instruction is reasonable and feasible, feasible in everyday practice. Analyzing the distinct classifications of variances and individual variability, which result in false negatives, will hopefully one day be improved by the uh, detection of glandular lesions. And I just like to say this was a recent case that I had. The PAP test was completely negative, so it was a sampling variance, basically. And uh, this is what we saw in biopsy, which was invasive adenocarcinoma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mangrino. And that's a good example too, because you can see on biopsy that squamous epithelium is completely over the top of the, the glandular lesion there. So it would have been pretty hard to sample that on a pap test. Absolutely. And I think that's the problem on a lot of these, right? They're just so high up or they're so deep or they have a historical gland involvement. It's just hard to sample them mm -hmm. uh, compared to squamous lesions. So that was really well done. Um, and for the audience, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, you can stop sharing, Dr. Mangrino. Okay. I'm going to launch the poll. This is, yep. And so you should see those on your screen. And then I will also, if there are any folks out there watching the video, I'll stick them up on the screen as well and give you a few moments to answer the questions. It looks like a lot of you are voting. Just give you a couple more moments. Okay. I'll share those results with you. So here are the correct answers and um, it looks like most people got answer one correct. Um, this number is always higher than I expect it to be, but 25% of invasive cervical carcinomas are adenocarcinomas. This has to do with the increased detection of precancerous lesions and squamous lesions and the percentage of the relative percentage of adenocarcinomas is going up, which is, as Dr. Mangrino covered, is, is one of the reasons why this um, educational um, co uh, uh, study was so imperative to see how detection could be improved. And then number two, which of the following was noted or recommended in the study? And the correct answer was some cases were not resolved even after educational instruction. And this is my bias because I wrote this question, but basically um, there was benefit of education. But what I, what I found interesting um, was that there were some cases that um, even there was no consensus on, right? You were still showing these two uh, trained like newer and more experienced pathologists and there were still some people calling cases where the patient ended up having you know endocervical adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma in say two um, reactive lesions so um, like you said um, they the, one of the suggestions they had is that maybe these cases should be shown at consensus um, I think that's a really good point for glandular lesions I tend I tend to have a much lower threshold for showing those cases to my colleagues um, the other thing that I thought was interesting, Dr. Mangrino, is you commented on the educational material um, and how it was an academic center. And I wondered, like, could they record that educational material and make it available to everyone else? Because if, you know, you could watch it every year or something like that, if you're someone who signs out pap smears, maybe that would be uh, beneficial for you and your patients. Yeah, that's and then a one thing, yeah, yeah. And then one other thing, yeah, because I mean, everything's online now, right? <laughs> and, uh, 
one of the other things I thought of is um, it would have been nice to know the final search path diagnosis on these cases because we know that they had, you know, AIS or endoscope, but like, did they have endoscopical gland involvement? Was it like your case that you showed where the squamous epithelium was completely over the top and there was just no prayer of sampling this at all? That, that just would have been interesting, I think, to correlate more tightly, but it was a, it was a really interesting study. So thank you for that. And so You're I'll, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and then I'll stop sharing. And then Dr. Holling, you can go ahead and um, share your screen and I'll close down the polls. Is that good? That's good. We can see you and hear you. Go for it. Cool. So as mentioned, I'm uh, Joffrey Holling, uh, third year at University of Michigan. And uh, so, um, and here's the title of the talk that I'll be going over today. Sorry, just moving some stuff around. So briefly getting into some of the background um, from this, kind of the main focus that we'll be talking about today is benign appearing endometrial cells and what to do with those when seen on pap tests. So briefly, some of the background, uh, whether or not they're normal or an abnormal finding, um, they typically can be considered normal within uh, early cycle, particularly the first 12 days within premenopausal women. However, it is agreed that it's an abnormal finding within postmenopausal women with increased risk of hyperplasia and carcinoma. Uh, briefly, the papers um, that I'll kind of briefly be going over don't give a whole lot of morphology, so we're just going to briefly touch on that just to kind of um, cover that as well. So endometrial cells typically have small dark nuclei uh, or nuclei um, that are typically the size of about intermediate squamous cells um, with inconspicuous nucleoli. Uh, cytoplasm is typically scant with um, ill-defined cellular borders. They often have kind of 3D ball-like clusters for architecture, but you can also have um, rare isolated cells seen on pap test. Uh, mitotic activity is typically low to absent. And if stromal cells are present, um, they typically form these sort of dense aggregates. Um, you can see on the bottom right here with this uh, so-called double contour where the stromal cells are in the center and appear a little darker. And then on the outside, you have a layer of glandular cells. So the issue we'll kind of be talking about today is the fact from our perspective as um, pathologists or cytologists that um, the clinical history isn't always um, consistently provided. Um, so determining whether or not they may be postmenopausal isn't always that easy. Uh, so to kind of get around this in the past, they've recommended reporting based on age, um, as you can see here with Bethesda, uh, Bethesda uh, criteria. However, the issue with that is that there's concern that you're including a lot of asymptomatic premenopausal patients where there might not be any clinical benefit, so you're oversampling. Uh, to kind of address this, before we talk about the um, study for today, um, the same group did a previous study back in 2017, where they essentially, um, essentially wanted to evaluate uh, what the predictive value would be of seeing these benign appearing endometrial cells. So I'm briefly going to talk about that, because um, it kind of covers a lot of what um, we want to be going over today. So for that, they gathered cases from 2005 to 2015 and selected cases with benign appearing endometrial cells on PAP tests that then had a histopathologic follow-up, including biopsies, keratage, or hysterectomy within six months. And then from there, uh, they looked for relevant outcome measures, which they considered either atypical endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial carcinoma on follow-up. Uh, then using the absence of those, they calculated the negative predictive value um, in these cases where they observed benign appearing endometrial cells and split them into age groups um, with about five-year increments, as well as looking at history of bleeding um, uh, for analysis. I have the results here, but I'm going to kind of go to the figures because I think that's a, a little bit easier way to kind of get these, um, get the points across that they're trying to make. So on the table on the left here, you can see the age categories that I uh, previously talked about that they'd split them into, the number of cases they had, and how often atypical hyperplasia or carcinoma was seen, as well as the percentage. Um, 
then using the percentage, just the uh, correlate of that being the negative predictive value. The main take home point is you can see in the younger patients, uh, both the 40 to 44 age range and 45 to 49 has a very high negative predictive value of over 99%. Comparatively, that negative predictive value goes down with increasing age um, and uh, was significant for those uh, 50 and older compared to those at uh, 49 and younger for those age groups. Then getting into the history of bleeding, you can see the risk of either atypical hyperplasia or carcinoma seen here, where a history of bleeding in all age groups increases the risk, however, it becomes particularly pronounced once you get past the age of 50, as you can see here. So going over their final conclusions of this paper uh, was that benign appearing endometrial cells on pap tests are a normal finding in premenopausal women and uh, using age may result in unnecessary endometrial biopsies. So getting into the study today, um, some brief background. Uh, this group has had an institutional change where since 2017, uh, at the time they published their previous study, they've included a comment in patients uh, 45 and older who had benign appearing endometrial cells and had no uh, specified last menstrual period or menopause status. Uh, the comment reads, <clears throat> routine periodic screening is recommended for asymptomatic premenopausal women 45 and older with cytologically unremarkable endometrial cells on their pap tests. Please confirm that this patient is neither postmenopausal nor experiencing abnormal uterine bleeding. So that gets into the study of today where their current goals were to see if this educational comment that they've added um, can lead to decrease um, endometrial biopsies um, after having benign appearing endometrial cells on their pap test. And as kind of a secondary goal, they wanted to make sure that if they had decreased uh, sampling, would the clinical outcomes change? So the actual methods for the study were to perform an EMR search between May 1st, uh, 2017 and December 31st of 2019. From there, they uh, gathered uh, demographic uh, information, including age, menopause status, symptoms at presentation, ultrasound findings, and outcome during the study period, and then evaluated whether to see if the patients had undergone procedures within six months, uh, procedures including biopsy, curatage, or hysterectomy, and compared to the results, uh, what the results had been prior to this uh, educational comment having been added. Additionally, as I mentioned, they wanted to make sure clinical outcomes uh, would not be affected. So they evaluated again for atypical hyperplasia or endometrial carcinoma in asymptomatic premenopausal patients. Getting into the results, um, as you may have uh, gathered, this is kind of more of a information dense paper. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of uh, go over the figures and talk on some of the key points from there. Uh, Following their EMR search, they found, you can see on the right here, the total number of cases, 175 that had had this comment. Out of there, 37 had undergone biopsy previously uh, for a total of 21%. You can also see in this paper or in this table, they compared both asymptomatic uh, premenopausal patients versus those who were symptomatic or postmenopausal. And unsurprisingly, those who are asymptomatic uh, had less biopsies at about 7% versus about two thirds of those who were symptomatic or postmenopausal. Then in the second table, this is where they actually compare their first goal um, of the study, where, as I mentioned, from up here, 21% had undergone biopsy. And when they compared that to prior to their biopsy being added, uh, it was 48%. So doing a two-sided Fisher test, the p-value was less than 0.01. Uh, so a significant decrease during, uh, after the addition of that comment. Uh, additionally, they said they wanted to evaluate for atypical hyperplasia or carcinoma um, to make sure it hadn't changed since they've added this comment. It was actually fairly low before. You can see here from 2005 to 2015, uh, there was only one. And since uh, the comment's been added, there's been no cases with a follow-up of 11 to 37 months at this point. Uh, just briefly, additionally, you can see uh, in this top table again, that 14 patients who were symptomatic uh, ended up not receiving any uh, biopsy. So they wanted to see what the actual follow-up was in, in these patients. Uh, so briefly going over this, all the patients had um, some sort of atypical bleeding and uh, 
when they did an EMR search, they found that all of them had ordered, uh, clinicians had ordered ultrasounds. So going over those, the vast majority were normal, which you can see here. However, um, a few didn't follow up, um, but of the significant findings, they had one case with a thickened endometrium who reportedly had irregular cycles. So it was kind of hard to correlate whether that was true thick, uh, true and truly abnormal finding. And then on follow-up, her bleeding actually stopped and the follow-up ultrasound was normal one year later. A separate patient had, uh, was found to have lyomyomata on her ultrasound and then went hist underwent hysterectomy, which at that time, the endometrial component was found to just be benign. There was one other patient who didn't have any biopsy within the six month period, but did have one a year later. So she wasn't included as the six month follow-up, but the biopsy just showed uh, disordered proliferative um, endometrium. In the end, the clinical outcomes all um, were benign with pretty much all of them having resolution of their atypical bleeding. So that was kind of the major take home point um, from all of these cases. Getting into their discussion, um, they reiterated that the addition of their educational comment was to provide um, clinicians with an updated consensus guideline that no further evaluation is recommended in asymptomatic premenopausal patients with benign appearing endometrial cells. Uh, as we kind of went over in the results, uh, since they added that comment, the number who had received biopsies had decreased from 48% down to 21. And despite this de decrease in the number of biopsies, there had been no um, no evidence of increase in atypical hyperplasia or carcinoma with the follow-up to this point, which was consistent with their prior um, reported studies, uh, uh, reported value of high negative predictive value in these cases. Additionally, on the last slide, I kind of talked about um, how most of those who did have um, clinical findings but underwent conservative management appeared to have benign outcomes. So they suggested that um, this may actually represent physiologic var uh, variation over true pathology for many cases of premenopausal bleeding. Uh, so they suggested that ultrasound or other kind of non-surgical, more clinical methods may be more helpful in determining management of these cases. Their final conclusions were that this educational comment was effective in reducing the number of unnecessary biopsies in cases of benign appearing endometrial cells and that uh, more attention should be paid to clinical factors, including bleeding, ultrasound findings, and menopause status when determining how to manage these cases. So kind of my own takes. Um, for a strength, I really liked how this study kind of highlighted how what we do within pathology and the way we sign out our reports really influence clinical management. Um, I think from like a trainee perspective, particularly, we focus so much on morphology that um, at least I'm guilty of kind of overlooking what the true clinical impact can kind of be. So I appreciated the study sort of addressing that. Uh, one thing I kind of thought was interesting is that they focused on the fact that they said this comment was kind of the big um, key point of why they thought their um, biopsies had decreased over this time period. However, they didn't really talk about other factors, which I think can uh, be pretty significant as well. Uh, kind of just some quick points I thought. Uh, I think communication between both pathology and the clinicians uh, can vary at institution, but I think that's a big factor in exactly how, um, how often clinical management can change. Uh, additionally, it's possible clinicians are just more up to date on guidelines from institution to institution. And uh, it can also be institution dependent on how consistent clinical history is provided. Um, so I thought those were all factors that they never really talked about in the paper that I'd be kind of interested in. Finally, from kind of an application standpoint um, within at least University of Michigan here, uh, we don't really have any educational comment. We include outside of the diagnostic lines of endometrial cells present or endometrial cells present in a patient over age 45. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we haven't done any analysis to see how our clinical team sort of approaches these. Um, so I think that would kind of be the first step to see whether or not uh, oversampling or too much follow-up with biopsies was an issue at our institution. However, if it was found that that was kind of a thing that we wanted to address, it, educational comment certainly is one way that you could um, start to approach that. But as I kind of alluded to in my last slide, I always think direct communication with the clinical team is kind of the first um, best initial step to kind of address this. 
uh, additionally, um, it might be possible to kind of find ways to make sure that uh, having clinical history provided is a more consistent thing, um, such as like uh, stops in the EMR requiring clinicians to sort of provide what the clinical history is or the last menstrual period. So that was kind of another way um, that you could get um, to address this issue. And that was it for me, so thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Halling, that was excellent. And like you said, that was a very um, sort of tech and uh, sort of analytical paper without a lot of images, which I think always think are easier for pathologists. So you did a really nice job summarizing that for everyone. Um, and I liked your, your take home points of, um, you know, the, the importance of having a good history. And I think it's easy when you're signing out PAPS because you have so many to look at that um, if the LMP isn't provided, sometimes that can create a bit of a, you know, a vacuum. So um, knowing that information is good and hopefully with EMRs being implemented and getting more sophisticated, like you said, you can um, have an, a, a required entry point for that just to know if the patient is still menstruating or something like that. But then of course, once you start getting into this 45 age range, you get into the perimenopausal status where patients don't really know if they're postmenopausal or they're sort of kind of perimenopausal. So um, I think the educational comment is a really um, good idea. And I think it's always nice to give clinicians something to go on because they're also very busy and going through you know, high volumes of patients and results in a day. So if you can put any kind of comment that helps them, it's interesting. So it'll It'll be interesting to see once this kind of thing gets out there, if this becomes something more institutions implement. Um, I like that idea. So uh, yeah, someone's thanking you all. I've gotten a couple of comments for that. So I will go ahead and launch the poll for this article and folks can go ahead and start answering those. And um, Joff, if you wanna stop sharing, I can sh um, put my- Oh yeah, absolutely. Up. Yeah. My screen up for- those watching the video. These are a bit longer, so I'll give you a little more time. Okay, go ahead and end the polling, share the results. So I don't usually try to make these questions impossible. Um, the first question is, which of the following is true regarding endometrial cells and pap smears? The answer is they are a normal finding in the first 12 days of the menstrual cycle in premenopausal patients. The rest of those answers are just wrong. And then the second uh, question was, um, which of the following is a conclusion of this study? Oh, and for the first one, 91% of you got them right. Um, Good work. Um, uh, and some people put they are always normal in postmenopausal patients. I'm guessing that you just read the question wrong. So the second one, which of the following is the conclusion of the study? The correct answer was the finding of endometrial cells in postmenopausal patients has a high negative predictive value in the absence of other clinical findings, namely as Dr. Holling talks about bleeding um, or um, you know transvaginal ultrasound findings and things like that. So um, it is interesting to kind of correlate those together and the rest are just um, incorrect. So now I will stop sharing and Joff, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, and thank you. Dr. Teklu, you can go ahead and share your screen and you can turn on your camera if you want to as well, Dr. Teklu. I think you stopped me. The, say the oh. host. Ah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Try it now. There you go. Cool. Right. Thank you.
All right, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Baby Teklu. I'm a UN fellow here at Cedar Sinai. So today I'm going I'm uh, talking about you know the paper um, title is uh, Endocervical Endocarcinoma in Situ from the Pap Nuclei Test to Hysterectomy, a series of 74 cases. So this paper is uh, written uh, from a group uh, in Chicago, Illinois, I think it's Rush University, and published in 2021 on Journal of American Society of Cytopathology. So before I jump into the paper, I'm just trying to give you know, the introduction and I'll try to uh, discuss the cytomorphology of AIS. So as intro, so endocervical AIS, which is different from uh, a, a typical glandular cytology. This is a specific diagnosis. It, it's a precursor lesion to invasive endocervical adenocarcinoma. And then it progressed to invasive uh, adenocarcinoma after seven to 10 years. But not all AIs lead to invasive endocervical adenocarcinoma. And then the, the major HPV uh, associated with AIs is HPV 16 and 80, specifically HPV 80 is more common in adenocarcinoma. And uh, as you know, cytology is a screening test for both squamous intraepithelial lesion and endocervical AIS. But the sensitivity is uh, less, especially for screening endocervical AIS. And then the treatment is excision or hysterectomy, depending on the patient preference. Here, I'm just trying to you know, briefly discuss, uh, I think the first presenter already discussed or, you know, about you know, the cytomorphology of AIS. So as you know, it's a typical cells with hyperchromasia, elongated nuclei, and then they have high NEC ratio and the chromatin is usually uh, coarse. And then under, especially under, you know, medium or low power, you see the feathering at the edge of, you know, the cluster, or sometimes you, you can see rosetting with uh, overlap or pseudo stratification of the nuclei. And then this is to show the, the, his, the corresponding histology. As you can see here, there is hyperchromasia, pseudo stratification, and then we also see apoptosis and mitosis. Uh, especially in the cytology, if you see, it's rare to see you know, nucleoli in, uh, in the neoplastic cells. So if we see nucleoli, I think the option is either it's invasive adenocarcinoma or reactive process. And then the major differential diagnosis for uh, EIS in cytology is uh, H-cell, invasive endocervical adenocarcinoma, reactive process, tubular metaplasia, and also endometrium or endometriosis. A sample directly from the, uh, the LUS, which is the lower uh, uterine segments. So now we come to the paper, the study is, it's a retrospective study and their goal is to determine the relative sensitivity of different diagnostic approach for the diagnosis of endocervical glandular lesion, specifically for endocervical AIs. So like I said, it's a retrospective study. They try to uh, uh, you know, um, select patient with uh, any uh, diagnosis of AIS starting from 2005 to 2019. And then they, can, they were able to identify 74 cases based on that criteria. And then they also tried to review uh, the different diagnostic approach where the diagnosis, the AIS diagnosis was made, which include a cervical pap test, cervical biopsy, cryptage, lip, cervical bone, uh, cone biopsy, or hysterectomy. So they were trying to uh, review all the sample uh, uh, where the patient was diagnosed for AIS. And then all these samples were diagnosed by two pathologists. And they also tried to uh, include uh, the cytology six months before the diagnosis of EAS, the histology diagnosis of EAS. And uh, all the PAPs were liquid-based and then they use a chi-square to analyze their data. So here is the summary of their results. So these 74 patients, they have AIS plus or minus, you know, squamous intraepithelial lesion or invasive squamous carcinoma or invasive endocervical carcinoma. So the age range at the 
the diagnosis of AIS was 18 to 73, and then the average was close to 40. And then 77% of these patients, their age is between 30 to 50. And 66% uh, of these patients, they have you know, uh, a diagnosis of AIS during histologic examination, which is a you know, high number. That means 44% you know, they have, don't have uh, a negative, uh, they have a negative cytology or they're not sure whether they have you know, AIS or not. So like I said, you know, 34% they have abnormal glandular cytology, only close to 11% they make a diagnosis of uh, cytology. Uh, based on cytology only. And then 90% 90, 90 of the patients they have abnormal squamous or glandular cytology. So like I said, they try to see uh, the different diagnostic approach, cytology, screening cytology, biopsy, lip, and hysterectomy. So among 74 patients, 42 patients they have you know, uh, cervical biopsy. And then they have AIS, 31 of them, they have, uh, they have endocervical AIS and 15 of them, they have prior positive uh, abnormal glandular cytology. And then 11 of the 42 biopsies were negative, but they showed AIS on the follow-up, lip or hysterectomy or cone biopsy. And then 53 patients, they have lip or cone biopsy, and then almost 97% they have AIS. So 42% they have previous biopsy, which was positive for you know, a typical glandular cell or AIS. And uh, most of them, I would say 55%, they have a negative uh, finding before the leap, which is incidental. And then two out of 53, they have negative after positive biopsy. Or prior, prior biopsy or cytology was positive, but the leap was negative. And then 52 percent, uh, 50 per, uh, 52 patients they have hysterectomy, both for EIS or squamous intraepithelial lesion or other reason. And uh, uh, among them, 46 was for EIS. So this table is taken from the paper. It's trying to show the sensitivity of the different diagnostic approach. As you can see here, the cone or the lip has the highest uh, uh, sensitivity, which is close to 96%. And uh, the cytology, if they, we include all the glandular, uh, you know, cytology, a typical glandular cytology, the sensitivity is 34. And then uh, uh, interestingly, the combination of cytology and biopsy has lower uh, sensitivity than, you know, only ECC or biopsy. And then last, like I mentioned in the previous slide, and 45, 55% of the, uh, the cases in the cone, they have you no know, incidental finding. That means they have a negative uh, cytology or biopsy before the, the leap. So here again, only 11% of the patient, they had EIS diagnosis by PAP screening. Again, this is from the paper. They're trying to show you know, the, the different uh, a typical glandular uh, cytology. So the first one is, as you can see, is a classical AIS. There is a feathering edge, uh, increased uh, NEC ratio, hyperchromasia. And then this one is there is a sim some hint of feathering at the edge. So they call it suspicious for AIS. And then this one, they call it a typical glandular cell. They favor neoplastic. So as you can see it's here, it's a hyperchromic, uh, high NEC ratio. The cells, they look uh, malignant, and then they call it you know, uh, a typical glandular cell, but they didn't commit whether it's endocervical or endometroid. And then this one, they call it a typical glandular cell, NOS. Uh, here, for me, they look the same as you know, the, the, the picture in the C. So as a discussion, most of their finding is consistent with uh, and the previous uh, reporting. Like as you can see here, the age uh, at the diagnosis of AS, this finding is close to 40, and then it was reported uh, 37 in other study. Uh, the same is true for abnormal PAP. Uh, it's greater than 90, 90%, and then it's reported 80, 88%, and 34% for uh, abnormal glandular PAP. It was reported between 38 to 56. And 
this finding 11% uh, AIS di uh, diagnosis based on uh, cytology screen, which is close to the reported finding, which is 11.1. And then they also, the paper also mentioned that, you know, uh, uh, the reason why the cytology screening has low sensitivity, they include because of small size of the lesion, sampling difficulty and difficulty recognizing AIS on the PAP tests. And the, the other discussion is the sensitivity of hormone granular cytology plus uh, the biopsy, like I've said, is 55.4% uh, 55, 55, uh, 55 and uh, it was reported on 60.8, slightly lower than the reported one. And then incidental AIS finding at CON for uh, cell is 55% in this study, which is higher than the reported, which was 50%. So regarding our strengths, uh, it's, uh, they try to include the data from 14 years. I think it's extensive study. And then as you know, uh, AIS is rare entity. And then the weakness is they don't include the histologic finding in their paper. And also they don't mention whether, uh, you know, the pathologists who reviewed the site, especially the cytology specimen, whether they are, you know, board certified cytopathologists or they're just general pathologists. And then they also didn't mention, you know, some place they make the definitive AS diagnosis based on the cell block, which from the, the cytology specimen. But they didn't mention how they make, whether it's directly from the screening or if they had, you know, a cell block to make the AS diagnosis on cytology. So the application is uh, since the uh, uh, cytology screening has a low sensitivity, I think we, we have to look for uh, AIS on lip or any tissue biopsy for any other reason, for squamous intraepithelial lesion or for any other reason, we have to look for the the AIs, uh, the AIs, uh, to not to miss on the lip or tissue biopsy. That's all I have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Teklu. I think you did a really good job summarizing this study. And um, you know, I know you and I talked before. We went live about um, some of the interesting parts of this paper about how they call this sensitivity and then they mentioned that you know their patient population might have been a little bit um, skewed towards knowing the outcome of these cases so um, it's a really you know it's a hard question to get at so their study design I think is one way of doing it and it, it had some interesting findings especially this idea of like diagnosing AIS on LEAP and hysterectomy, which of course, you know, as a GYN person, you know, happens. So um, I think they did some interesting work there. And I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and launch this polling for the third paper. And you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen and I'll put them up on the screen. And I won't give quite as much time. So we have a little bit of time to wrap up at the end. Give you a few more seconds. Okay, and I'll share the results. So for these questions, I was trying to get which of the following is true regarding glandular lesions and pap smears. The pap smear has increased sensitivity for squamous compared to glandular lesions. I think Dr. Teklu talked about how the pap smear was designed for squamous lesions, not for glandular lesions. And that's sort of the theme of today's journal club, um, how we're trying to get better at that. And then which was a conclusion of this study? Um, leaps and hysterectomies are sometimes a method for diagnosing AIS um, that only about 10% of the patients in this study had a definitive diagnosis of AIS on pap smear. So um, that's, that's good to know. And uh, the participants, if you all wanna just turn your cameras back on really quickly so everyone can see your faces. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I, I don't see any questions, but since we've already discussed your articles after you presented, I think we're good to go. Do any of you have any closing comments or anything you'd like to say on the way out? No, you're just full of joy about glandular lesions on pap smear. <laughs> 
Thanks for including me in this uh, discussion and I enjoyed hearing the other presenters as well. Thanks guys. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely learned a lot and I thought you all did a really good job. And everyone remember to fill out the survey on your way out. And if you are someone who's interested in presenting, please reach out to me. And thanks again to all our presenters and we'll see you all in December. Thank you. Bye all. <laughs>